minus 20, still counting at this time. We have ignition sequence start. Six. Good afternoon, and welcome to the ATCO Space Lab Speaker Series. My name is Claire Porbe, and I'm a platform specialist with the transformation team at ATCO, and I will be your moderator for today. I am honored to live and work in Treaty 7, the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Nitsidabi, comprised of the Siksika, the Kainai, and the Bugani Nation, the Satina Nation, and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bears Paw, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary, Mokinstis, is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. I would also like to pay my respect to elders, past and present, in the communities and regions where we operate. Now this is the first lecture in the ATCO Space Lab Speaker Series this year. These lectures are a chance for us to share knowledge and insights from thought leaders, providing our ATCO colleagues and ATCO's network of peers, partners, and friends with information on promising developments, trends, and leadership in exciting and relevant fields. Now, before we get underway, I would also like to remind everyone that this event is a one-way video and audio format. Please ask questions by using the question icon to the right of your screen, and we will open up question functionality roughly midway through Dr. Sanders and Dr. Lee's lecture, and we'll reserve 30 minutes at the end to answer any questions. Now, I'd like to introduce Andrea Kleiberlangen, Vice President Transformation at ATCO, who has some welcoming remarks and will introduce our speakers. Thank you, Claire. Thank you all for joining us today for our first ACO Space Lab Speaker Series event of 2023. Please check out the ACO Speaker Series replay playlist on the ACO Group YouTube channel to view recordings of our past speakers. If this is the first time you have heard about the ACO Transformation Team, we can't wait to tell you more. In addition to presenting this series, ACO's Transformation Team also leads ACO Space Lab. Space Lab is an enterprise-wide framework of collaborative support for the creative energy of our colleagues. Space Lab is a source of funding and expertise for any ATCO employee wanting to test and to achieve sustainable new value for the company and for our customers. And we as a team have supported the achievements of over 130 project teams since the fall of 2019. Today, we are joined by Dr. Barry Sanders and Dr. Megan Lee from Calgary's new quantum training, research, and innovation hub called Quantum City. We are excited to hear more about Quantum City and quantum technology, a topic whose relevance for ATCO includes quantum computing for optimization problems, such as root optimization and resource allocation for an increasingly complex energy grid. To share just a bit of information about our wonderful presenters today, Dr. Sanders is Scientific Director of Calgary's Quantum City and Director of the Institute for Quantum Science and Technology at the University of Calgary. He received his PhD in 1988 and Doctor of Science in 2018 from Imperial College London, and his research includes theory of quantum sensing, quantum communication, quantum computing, and quantum optics. He has held distinguished international visiting professorships and is a scientist mentor with the Creative Destruction Lab at both the Universities of Toronto and Calgary. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, of the United Kingdom Institute of Physics, of the American Physical Society, and of Optica, formerly the American Optical Society and he is the recipient of the City of Calgary's International Achievement Award in 2022. Welcome, Dr. Sanders. Moving on to Dr. Lee. Dr. Lee is Managing Director of Calgary's Quantum City with nearly 20 years experience across the full spectrum of research, innovation, and commercialization. She has a significant depth of experience in various organizations from operational leadership at a publicly traded biotech company 
to the world's top university affiliated incubator and to a large oncology research and care funder. She holds a PhD in biochemistry and an MBA in entrepreneurship and technology commercialization from the University of Alberta. I am so pleased to welcome you both, Dr. Sanders and Dr. Lee, and I invite you to join me up here to share your expertise with us this afternoon. Okay, thank you very much for the really kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. One accolade that wasn't mentioned is I'm very proud I got my high school diploma about a five minute walk from here at Bishop Carroll High School. So I'm very local and I've, I've looked at ATCO from my, the, the windows of the school for many years. It's my first time on site and I hope it's not the last. But it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, now I'm gonna share the passion that I have for quantum. So the title of the talk is um, The Quantum Frontier. And so this is meant to give you the idea that you know there's of course, there's quantum mechanics, the mystery that I'm going to go into, but the frontier aspect is the, uh, the idea that somehow we're entering a very risky, exciting uh, opportunity of exploiting quantum mechanics. And I'll tell you about what, what, uh, what are the essence of quantum mechanics, what's been achieved in the past, what we're hoping to do in the future, and at some point I'll hand over to Megan, who will uh, discuss Quantum City and what we're doing here in Calgary to to make sure that Calgary's at the forefront of what could be a revolution in certain technologies. Okay, so I'll just begin. I'm gonna, in one slide, I'm gonna try to give you the point. Um, quantum mechanics is famously difficult to understand. There was a saying many years ago by one Nobel laureate that, you know, I think maybe, this is from decades ago, maybe a dozen, half a dozen people understand relativity only, but I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. And so there's famous statements by a number of of uh, physicists over time that say nobody gets it. And I'm, uh, I've been doing quantum science for over 40 years and I can say that I'm in that list. And I'll convey in this slide what quantum mechanics is about and what it is we don't get. But after this slide, then we put aside the philosophical conundrum and then we focus on, on exploiting. So we don't really have to understand it to make use of it. It works. Um, and we can philosophize about it after hours and during regular hours we find ways to make everything work as it should. Okay, um, and so the point here is that quantum mechanics is both really hard to comprehend and yet it's, ex it's essential for existing and future technology. And this is the case that I'm going to make as I go through the early slides. Um, you can see at the bottom left, this is uh, showing like a rainbow, and this is really telling you about the birth of the subject of quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics was born in November 1900. It's not often that a scientific field has a birthday. But we have the birthday here, and the birthday celebrates that um, the understanding of the intensity of the different colors that radiate from the sun is understood. So throughout the 19th century and before that, there was no good explanation, no good theory to explain why a hot object like the sun has a particular balance of colors. The sun's surface is 6,000 Kelvin, which is one of the curves, and you can see it peaks in the violet, there's yellow, etc. Anyway, so the person who figured this out was Max Planck, and his paper came out in November 1900, and it explained it. But it was very puzzling, because it told us that, um, uh, that the exchange of energy between um, matter, the sun, and uh, light, so creating light, comes in what are known as quantum jumps, quantum leaps, whatever, that there's bundles of energy. Now, you know, if you think of walking up a hill, your, your um, potential energy rises continuously, go down, it, you uh, lose it continuously, and yet quantum mechanics tells you this is not actually happening. It tells you that energy is exchanged in bundles, and this is very puzzling. Um, so that's where the theory came out. Max Planck tried to stay on safe ground. He said, I have this radical theory, but it only applies to hot objects radiating and nothing else. And it was Einstein five years later, he got the Nobel Prize for it, who realized that it was even more general than Planck wanted it to be. And so the cat was out of the bag. This whole puzzling theory was needed and not fully understood. Um, you can see uh, another picture. It's just a, a lot of spikes in a graph. And that's telling you something else about the radiation from the sun. So the color spectrum is not continuous. There are holes in it. And the holes... Um, are described by having atoms with electrons 
that go around in discrete orbits. So the electron orbits the nucleus, but it can't do that. It can't change its level of orbit in a continuous way. That would correspond to a continuous change of energy. And so the holes in the spectrum um, are only described by quantum mechanics, and those holes in the spectrum actually pointed to what the sun is made of. This is the spectrum for helium. Um, so helios is the Greek word for sun, and helium was discovered in this way. It was the first element to discover first off the Earth and on the Earth. At the heart of all this, you can see um, on the left side of the screen, it said light is a, and then I don't know what you see, it's partly psychological, but it says light is a wave and light is a particle. It says both things together. Um, and this description that was done by Hofstetter, who's a member of five different departments in Chicago, and uh, um, he, he's got linguistic, physics, many different uh, activities. And so he kind of represented the essence of the mystery of quantum mechanics in this way. And so the idea of quantum mechanics, the idea of, in physics, we'll often describe particles, like an electron is a point object with fixed momentum and energy and et cetera. It's got properties to it. And then we'll think of light as a wave. And we can think of water waves and sound waves. And waves are all... Um, delocalize, they interfere with each other, and particles are tiny objects that bump into each other, they don't break up, they're, they're somehow fundamental, and yet quantum mechanics tells us they're two sides of the same coin. That quantum, uh, that the objects that we deal with can be wave-like or particle-like under the conditions uh, where, where we, um, uh, depending on the conditions where we observe. And so then the discrete energy of the electron going around the nucleus can be described by understanding it as both a particle and a wave. And then the electron going around makes a standing wave. And so we have a conceptual framework to understand what quantum mechanics is about. But the implications are enormous. On the right, this picture represents a conundrum that was presented by Erwin Schrodinger, another Nobel laureate in physics. And Erwin Schrodinger is one of the originators of quantum mechanics, but one of the objectors. The same with Einstein and a number of others. So it's interesting how the originators of the field tried to argue that it must be wrong, it must be incomplete. And so Schrodinger posed the following problem. He said, let's consider radioactive decay. And then you can see there's a nucleus and an alpha particle, which is a helium, doubly ionized helium or a helium nucleus. Um, and alpha particle decay can be thought of as um, there's a nucleus, and then two protons and two neutrons bound together as a, as a particle. They bounce around on the inside, and then they have some probability of escaping. So our whole idea of radioactive decay with alpha particles and its exponential in time profile is really a reflection of the probability for the alpha particle to escape. But we understand the nucleus at a quantum mechanical level, and quantum mechanically, when we describe a nuclear decay like this, we describe it by thinking of the alpha particle as a wave. And this means that it sits both inside and outside at the same time. And Schrodinger said, if that's true, then let's imagine a cat inside a box and put a, a poison gas in the box. It's not humane, but this is a thought experiment only. Um, and so then that poison gas is triggered by the detection of an alpha particle. So if you remember in high school going, going around with Geiger counters that go click, 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 they're just, these are the detection events. And so then Schrodinger is saying, I'm going to use a cat as my detector, and the cat will die if the alpha particle is released, and the cat will live if not. And so then the result of that is that quantum mechanics tells us if the alpha particle is both inside and outside, and it's correlated with the whether the cat's dead or alive, then even whether the cat is dead or alive becomes a, um, a not objective. And so there's a famous American saying, there are only two sure things in, in life, death and taxes. And quantum mechanics says, no, only taxes. That's the only, only sure thing that we have. Um, and then at the bottom right, this is a quantum mechanical notation. And so we have to deal mathematically with, with this non-objectiveness. And so this um, vertical line and an angular bracket, we call that a ket. It's half, half the word bracket. So it's the right side of a bracket. And, um, and then you can see that there's a state with an undecayed nucleus and a living cat, and a state with a decayed nucleus and a dead cat. And then we write this as some combined entity. And this is known as entanglement. So we have an entanglement between the state of the nucleus and the state of the cat. And this kind of question, you know, 
Can the cat really be a detector? What does it mean in quantum mechanics when we lose objectivity? And all that, we have a whole mathematical framework to, to, to describe to make probabilistic predictions, but fundamentally whether nature itself is probabilistic and how these correlations can be understood on some philosophical level, these are open questions. That's not the purpose of my talk, but it really, I'm just trying to get across to you that there are some deep challenges in understanding the field. Okay, so now I move away from the scientific uh, question marks, and I just wanted to tell you that quantum technology is not just about the future, it's also about the past. And so in the 20th century, we had a number of victories with quantum technology, and I put some of them here. Um, in the upper left, this is a picture of nuclear fuel. So nuclear energy, nuclear weapons, these are consequences of quantum mechanics. The whole E equals MC squared question, if you go into the mechanism, how we convert between matter and energy, we need quantum mechanics to describe it. The middle uh, top picture is a superconducting object and it's suspended by a magnetic field. In fact, this kind of uh, technology was at the heart for many years of, of concepts for maglev trains, the idea that trains would travel along tracks, be superconducting and be able to float. Um, there's challenges there, but that's the concept. What did become practical on the far right is a squid. Squid is short for a superconducting quantum interference device. They're really good at detecting very tiny magnetic fields, and they're at the heart of uh, magnetic resonance imaging. So hospitals, you know, if you're going to get MRIs done and they're expensive, clanky machines, it's all about being able to operate things like squids to be able to pick up magnetic fields from the brain. And the description of this is, uh, arises from quantum mechanics and superconductors are known as a supermaterial, um, and it's, it needs a quantum mechanical description. The lower left is another supermaterial. This is a superfluid, and so in this case, the superfluid sits inside of a bowl, and you can see it's dripping out the bottom, and what's happening is it's able, just like the alpha particle tunnels out of the nucleus, this fluid can tunnel out, and then the tunneling mechanism has to be understood, and it can be understood in terms of a film where it defies gravity and crawls out the other side. Um, the next picture on the bottom is a uh, depiction of an atomic clock. It turns out that atomic clocks, we can now keep track of, of time to the point where if we started a clock at the Big Bang, we would know the age of the universe within a second. That sounds really good, but it's not good enough for certain applications. And so making use of, of quantum mechanics of entanglement to be able to further enhance the precision of clocks is important. The next one is a little bit disconcerting. Uh, it looks like a laser eye surgery, but that's, um, uh, that's showing a laser and an application to it. And the laser uh, makes use of stimulated emission. This was a theory also by Albert Einstein back in 1917. Um, so it's uh, this emission, the, the way lasers operate requires a quantum mechanical description. And the last picture is a transistor. And the transistor, as people know, has um, revolutionized society. I don't know if people followed. The transistors um, got smaller and smaller according to something called Moore's Law. Unfortunately, Gordon Moore just passed away a few days ago, but the, you know, the increases, the, the importance of these um, have been around for a long time, and the transistor makes use of the fact that the electron can tunnel through a barrier. It can, the electron as a particle couldn't get through, but the electron as a wave is able to move from one place to another, and, and the transistor logic is underpinned by this. So these are examples of what's been done. Now what I want to talk about is where we're going next. And so um, roughly for the 21st century, we, and we involves lots, there's Alberta strategies, there's Quantum City, national, international strategies. A lot of this can be tied to geopolitics, to um, questions of, of, of advanced manufacturing and many different areas. And so there's a consensus growing internationally, and you can see this in national strategic plans, that roughly we break up the quantum technology potential revolution into three different types. The first one is sensing imaging metrology. We often refer to this shorthand as sensing, uh, but it includes the three. Um, so the idea of sensing is to know something is present. It might be you know, you might want to know that there's a certain gas, you want to tell by refraction of air what the temperature of something is, uh, pick up fine magnetic fields. Imaging is, is about, it could be facial recognition, it can be de detecting um, uh, imaging of, of aircraft flying overhead, submarines. And then metrology are things like atomic clocks and others where we, we want to be able to 
get the standards for measurement to the ultimate limit. And quantum mechanics, another side of quantum mechanics from this wave particle duality is something that's famous in, in the public domain. It's known as the uncertainty principle. And the uncertainty principle tells us that if we don't manage the system smartly, there's a quantum, there's an effect of quantum noise and things, that things are somehow noisy on a fine enough scale. It's not exactly what quantum mechanics says. The wave particle duality doesn't say there's a fundamental noise. It just says that because these complementary wave particle things are there, there's a trade-off in what you learn about, from, about one versus the other. So the game that we play in sensing imaging metrology is how we can shuffle the noise away from what we don't care about to what we do care about. So making a better clock and various other things is, is, is a matter of trying to get the noise shuffled away. Um, and the advantage can be things like that squid, being able to pick up with very low energy an object. This can be important in imaging aircraft. I always think of these Hollywood movies where um, the pilot will say something like, oh, they locked onto me. If you've seen the latest uh, uh, Maverick, what is that, the, the Tom Cruise movie? Um, uh, Top Gun, Top Gun Maverick, yeah, Top Gun Maverick, um, you know, they lock on, but if you could image an aircraft without them knowing, then they don't even know they're locked on to. So all these kinds of applications, and I'm sorry to steer towards military applications, but they're often the most dramatic to, to uh, explain. Um, communication and networks, so the other, another side of it is um, there's all kinds of threats to communication, to network capability, um, and so we're uh, uh, we can imagine networks where we share useful resources like entanglement, and we can also make use of uh, make things secure against quantum enabled adversaries. So if we could make a quantum computer at scale, none of the existing methods for encryption, if you know RSA and Pell's equation and elliptic curve cryptography and all these things, they would be completely vulnerable, crackable against quantum computers. So um, there's an issue about security against quantum-enabled adversaries. In the United States, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, recently picked six winners of its ongoing program to develop a crypto standard that's safe against quantum computers, and they're intending to release a standard in 2024, and the expectation, at least in the U.S. and probably beyond to Five Eyes countries like Canada, is that we'll be expected to adopt these kinds of uh, standards for, for high levels, national security levels of, um, of secure communication. Um, and also the other side of, of quantum is by making use of entanglement. If you know this, take for example the whole Huawei um, you know, scandal that's going on is we go to 5G, do we trust their equipment? But in quantum mechanics, by making use of entanglement checking in principle, uh, we can buy communication equipment from anybody and make use of uh, of, of checking entanglement to be able to verify security. So another direction we're going in quantum communication is to make use of this so that we don't care who the supplier is for any secure equipment. Um, and then finally, I mentioned the quantum computers. So we have um, the idea of, of uh, computing and simulation. And so um, there, like, there's a whole field of nanotechnology. Nanotechnology is addressing issues like how can we make things smaller and smaller? So it's kind of a Moore's Law thing again. Can we keep pushing the transistor technology? Can we find alternatives and make computers better and better? In the quantum area, we're not about that. We're not trying to make computers better. We're trying to identify certain problems that are considered intractable. And an example uh, with communication security, like RSA, is we trust internet security because we believe it's hard to crack the problem. A quantum computer makes that easy to crack. So it's a very negative example. It means that um, uh, it, it, it's saying that we made a problem easy to solve, but the benefit of the problem is to destroy e-commerce. So it's not a good outcome. But on the other hand, um, it could be useful for other aspects. And I'll go into some of those. It could be useful for material design. It could be useful for the one that was mentioned uh, in the introduction. Um, before I stepped up about optimization, um, so discrete combinatorial optimization, those kinds of problems, there's possibilities. And in the nearer term, it's being used for and might have implications for chemistry. So where we see opportunities and threats, and it's often hard to know each thing, whether it's an opportunity or threat. This is why Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley, when she wrote the book Frankenstein, A Modern Prometheus, really gets across that idea that you have, you know, 
capability has a good side and bad side. So I'm telling you the opportunities and threats, but each thing is both in, in truth. Um, so in the quantum sensing area, which is now a shorthand for sensing, imaging, and uh, metrology, um, the idea is to break through this quantum noise barrier. So in applications where quantum noise matters, we want to be able to break through it. And where it comes up is clocks, global positioning systems, weak light detection, imaging, and I'll mention more in a moment. Quantum communication, the idea is that we want to be able to provide security against um, quantum computers as a threat, but there's other possible threats too. We also uh, have ways to be able to compress. If anybody knows information theory, there's Shannon, Claude Shannon's one of the most famous scientists of the 20th century and developed all the information theory. With quantum mechanics, we can break naive limits to information capacity in Shannon theory. Um, and sharing quantum resources, sharing entanglement to make use for various things, for example, clock networks. Quantum computing, as I said, we're not about trying to make computers better. We're, we, we have a few tricks up our sleeve, and so these capture the three that um, we really try to exploit. One is search, and so it takes time to search an unstructured database. In computer science, this would be a function inversion problem, and we have to be able to search things. Quantum Quantum computing guarantees a quadratic speed up. So if it takes, there's a lot of caveats I can deal with in question time, but if, if it takes time t to solve the problem, all th in, in, depending on how you measure t, but basically it would scale the square root of t to do it on a quantum computer. Period finding um, can be done almost exponentially better. I wrote exponential, but if anybody's technical, I can explain that it's a sub-exponential speed up if anybody wants to get into that. And the idea is that we can solve linear equations, perform cryptanalysis. Essentially, quantum computers are really good at finding periods of things. And so for the right problems, period finding becomes really important. It's very important in, in code breaking because um, people who break codes are looking for periods of different symbols, but it's useful for other things too. And then the optimization, machine learning, and chemistry I'll mention a bit more about, but these are ways to, these are application areas to exploit quantum computing. There's no provable betterness of quantum computers for these applications, um, but there's a lot of optimism that these are potentially valuable, and we're kind of in an experimental stage where we're testing how good these things are, where the applications are. So in quantum sensing, this just shows you a picture of, on the upper left, this is um, an idea of molecular detection, and uh, so we want to be able to detect properties or existence of molecules and do it better than what's possible with existing detector technology. The upper right shows LIGO, the Laser Interferometric Gravitational Wave Observatory. So most of astronomy has been about detecting light, a little bit about neutrons, but a few years ago um, the door was opened to detect gravitational waves. This is the base, one of the bases, it's in Louisiana, and their roadmap includes quantum technology, something known as squeeze light to shuffle the noise away, but if we want to be able to move gravitational wave detection into regimes that aren't only about black hole collisions, but deal with more ordinary objects, we need to make use of quantum technology. Uh, the lower left is a diamond where we make an artificial atom and use it as a sensor. Here in Calgary, we're building a quantum diamond foundry, so we're a major player in that. The, then the next picture is showing atoms. It's, a, it's detecting atoms. And then the lower right is the concept of imaging. As I mentioned, this would be a stealth aircraft, hard to see. And then this would be detecting one photon at a time. So you want to be able to pick up at extremely low light levels so the object doesn't know that surveillance has taken place. In quantum communication, I mentioned about the period. And so the way that our communication schemes work is they're very much um, the, the is essence of all forms of uh, high-level public key cryptography involve two stages. One is to share a key, and the second is to use a key to convey the message. When we look at using quantum technology to crack codes, we're not looking at breaking the message. We're looking at, at uh, uh, figuring out the key. And that T-shirt picture is just showing you that the way this is RSA, it's so easy, the, the algorithm is so easy, you can put on a shirt and remember the algorithm. And uh, it, essentially, there's just periods to it. So quantum computers are good at period finding. The far right is a picture of elliptic curve cryptography, which is the high-level type 4 national security crypto that would be used, for example, by the President of the United States. That was developed in Waterloo. Um, and uh, that's breakable by a quantum computer. And then down below, you can see satellite-based quantum communication. The world leadership in this is in China. It's a quantum satellite. And so both ground-based through optical fiber and satellite-based continental scale, 
uh, that's the world leader. You can imagine that uh, with current geopolitics, uh, with China being far ahead of others, then this um, uh, creates interest everywhere to be able to solve it. For me as a scientist, it's all good news. The more geopolitically um, complicated all this gets, the more funding there is to try to keep up. So I, I like getting funding for this kind of stuff. And, um, and then the way that these are done, the way we encrypt this, the bits of information is uh, the pulses in a superposition of arriving early or late. So if you ever, you know, you think that, are you, am I going to be early or I'm going to be late? In the quantum world, you can be early and late. And then we make, in our quantum uh, communication stuff, we actually take advantage of that. And then there's uh, quantum computing. And this, I, I told you before, there's really basically three algorithms. In fact, there's four. And so um, the upper left, this is uh, credited to Scott Aronson. He's a professor in computer science at the University of Texas in Austin. We make these structured diagrams that tell us how hard problems are. P at the bottom are the easy ones to solve. Um, and then when we go up the scale, they can be probabilistically solvable. They can be hard or easy. The left branch is easy. The right branch is hard. And essentially what we do with quantum computing, if we want high value results, is we want to be able to move a problem from a hard class to an easy class. The next picture is really, this is off Wikimedia, the backbone of images for Wikipedia. And this is just telling us how the searches take place on an unstructured database. The upper right is telling us how to do the period finding. Um, the lower one, this is uh, um, optimization. And then in this case, uh, there's a, something known as simulated annealing, optimization, where, um, where you just do this effective temperature. It's a probability of accepting bad results and then uh, exploiting that. And if we can use quantum mechanics, we might be able to tunnel through barriers that represent um, mathematical obstacles to finding optima. And then the next one, which is popular in the commercial world right now, is really, this is known as variational quantum eigensolvers. And these are ways to use quantum mechanics to estimate the lowest energy level of a system, like a molecule or a material, and then plug parameters back into a classical optimizer and then use the quantum computer to find the lowest energy. So if you start using quantum computers today and you pay commercially, you're essentially buying into this last algorithm. And then down below, there's just pictures. There's a lot of commercial quantum computing companies out there. That one on the far left is IBM's. I call that the gold chandelier. At the bottom of it would be a superconducting chip, the same essence as I mentioned about that superconducting quantum interference device. And then you have more. There's more superconducting systems, optical, ion trap, um, neutral atoms, photons. There's many different ways to build up quantum computers. Each one has advantages and disadvantages. That's why there's so many quantum computing companies right now, including a couple of, well, three unicorns out there. And the um, idea is that they're, uh, each one is trying different approaches. We don't know where the winner is. So we're in the wild west of trying uh, uh, all these different technologies at the same time. Um, where we're at today, um, so the bottom, that link is, if you go to doi.org, it's a compendium of, of digital object identifiers, 10 slash whatever. They, they run a hash service, so they give short digital object identifiers. That's where the article is. Essentially, it's written by John Preskill, who's a professor at Caltech, and now one day a week with AWS, Amazon Web Service, on one of their quantum teams. And he advocated what's known as noisy intermediate scale. And so the idea is that um, a number of years ago, we didn't want to work on any quantum computer that didn't have built into it error correction. Um, basically, it would, it would make mistakes as it went, but it would fix them. We take that as for granted with computers today. But the noisy intermediate scale, it, this paper that John Presco wrote is essentially a license saying, OK, let's forget about it for a few years, and let's make um, quantum computers that are noisy, imperfect, and run those and see if there's any advantage. And the price that we pay if they're noisy is there's an exponential drop in getting the right answer. So maybe we'll find some luck. And so right now, the paradigm we work in in quantum computing is we make use of this noisy intermediate scale. But I think um, the soothsayers are all converging on saying 2023 is the, is the watershed year where we're going to have to focus back on error correction mitigating noise. But that's where we're at the moment. If you buy a new quantum computer today, there's no error correction, no noise mitigation in the commercial systems. In the next two, three years, that's going to change. And I know this because a lot of the companies are out really trying hard to hire people who have expertise in this area. And, and this is one of the uh, bottlenecks in quantum computing is very few people are able to fill the positions because 
uh, it's hard to understand some of this stuff. And then this company, Gartner, if you might know, it's kind of a future predicting IT related company. This just gives you an idea of what Gartner predicted back in 2019. So they say with hundreds of qubits, and we're there now, it's chemistry applications, optimization, hundreds to thousands. We now have quantum computers that operate in these regimes. Um, there's machine learning and material science and, uh, and then the unknown, where it's going to lead to. And then Gartner in their report back in 2019 lists a lot of areas. The, you can see a lot of things mentioned there, but the real point, people say, what, if a quantum computer works, what's it good for? It'll be good for everything. It would change everything if it can work at that scale. Um, because even when you run code, you optimize, these things are all important. You know, even everything that's done on a computer has to be optimized. There's chip design, all this kind of stuff that goes on, even designing the chip. And so the quantum computer, if it works as hoped, and notice I always say if, I'm, I'm going to be very honest and realistic about what's possible, but if it works in the optimistic way, then it's, it's revolutionary. Okay, and then I think I'll skip this. This is just going to the mach quantum machine learning aspect and where quantum and AI are starting to overlap. The two areas, um, uh, the idea of using quantum to enhance machine learning, and the other is to make use of quantum computers to, um, there's something known as kernel methods, but basically models. It can be deep neural networks, et cetera, and quantum machines offer different models. And so, like, we could, for example, take a deep neural network imagine it as a physical entity and then replace the rules by quantum mechanics and, and make use of that. That's a big research area at Google right now. Um, so I won't go into it, I can tell you more. I always put this one up because it's written by one of my former students from the University of Calgary, this article. So, um, you know, as professors, it's like having children. We, our greatest pride is having uh, students who go on and uh, are better than we are. Okay, and then this article I put up, uh, as mentioned at the beginning, I'm a mentor for the Creative Destruction Lab, both University of Toronto and also the Rockies here in Calgary. Um, this article is written in the European Physical Journal, came out a couple years ago, and it's by um, Francesco Bova and Avi Goldfarber, both professors in the Rotman School of Business at the University of Toronto. Roger Melko is joint um, uh, with that program and also with Perimeter Institute and University of Waterloo. And the three of them wrote the story of what they learned nurturing uh, startups through the Creative Destruction Lab, and they boil it down. And, and they make uh, some interesting statements here. So the whole idea is to focus on commercial applications, and then they come to the conclusion that the success stories for quantum computing are related to combinatorial optimization. That was mentioned with um, the logistics types problems that were stated in the introduction before I stepped up. Um, and materials, pharmaceuticals, banking and finance, advanced manufacturing. So th these are the things that they evaluate um, where, where quantum computing can have shorter term benefits and uh, make sense from a financial point of view. And uh, I, I don't know exactly what Avi does. Uh, Francesco is an accounting professor in Toronto. So two out of the three are business oriented people. And so a lot of this paper is about the business analysis. These are things that I've done in my group with quantum computing, just to give you an idea of what's local. The upper left is just a picture representing uh, network security. Lower left is um, uh, Bitcoin, and so the question of, uh, so was my student with a professor at University of Lethbridge, what happens if a Bitcoin miner has access to a quantum computer and nobody else knows? And then you could start evaluating what would happen to the Bitcoin and all the blockchain in that. The middle picture is a project I have with John Chen in petroleum engineering, and this one we've been using the IBM quantum computer to model and solve problems to do with oil reservoir prediction, you know, so questions of how much resource you put down to be able to extract oil. The upper right is a facial landmark detection. So um, if you take pictures under passport picture conditions, we have excellent algorithms. We don't need quantum computing. But the wild type where you get faces, pictures of faces in the wild and have to rotate them to then use those algorithms is hard. So we, did, uh, we made use of D-Wave's quantum computer to solve that problem. And the lower right is an ongoing project with Quantum City's anchor partner emphasis, and this is pathogen matching, and the idea is to do rapid diagnostics of disease. Can I pass to you for the, okay. So that's it. I hope I didn't talk too slowly. <laughs> okay. So, so far you've heard from Barry that 
these emerging quantum technologies have tremendous potential to have tremendous impact on the world's largest markets. So I'm going to switch the gear a bit here and talk about the national landscape in quantum and talk about the resources that are available for Canadian companies who are quantum curious or hoping to explore some quantum pilot projects. So in order to really truly realize the benefit of quantum technologies, Canada essentially needs to convert its world leading science research into innovative commercial products. To do so, of course, we need a national quantum strategy that's sustained over time. So Canada announced its national quantum strategy in 2022 and updated a little bit in 2023 and comes with $360 million funding over seven years. So the national quantum strategy uh, stated three missions. One, to make Canada a world leader in quantum computing. And number two, to ensure the privacy and uh, cybersecurity of Canadians in quantum-enabled world. And finally, number three, to enable the government of Canada and key industries to become the early adopter of quantum sensing technologies. So it also has three pillars, uh, uh, research, talent, and commercialization. And um, University of Calgary actually was one of the four universities that were uh, uh, critical to developing this quantum national quantum strategy. And, oops. and these are some examples of funding opportunities for Canadian companies who are interested in doing some pilot projects. So first one, um, so probably the latest funding call that we know of in the research pillar is um, IDEA's quantum call. So IDEA stand for innovation for uh, defense, excellence and security. So essentially, it, this is in response to you know, rapidly developing quantum technologies. So the Department of National um, Defense wanted to essentially accelerate the translation of quantum technologies in defense and security domain. So it called for essentially formation of these micronets of partners in minimum three different organizations, and one of them had to be a post-secondary institution. Another popular one is uh, NSERC Alliance Grants. So as, um, under the National Quantum Strategy, um, NSERC has received $64 million for Alliance Quantum Grants. So one thing that's different about Alliance Quantum Grant is it, it requires zero cash contribution from industry partner. So 100% of the research is covered by NSERC, even though NSERC is taking zero ownership of the IP. So that's one interesting one. So in the part of talent side, of course, we have MyTax, who um, supports the mobilization of talent through internship. And just, uh, just yesterday, uh, we heard um, from MyTax that University of Calgary and Quantum City um, has put in an application for essentially an umbrella project. So for the next two years, Quantum City essentially has, has been given a lump sum of internship units that we can allocate for our quantum related projects. It's essentially speeding up the approval process for our quantum interns and also essentially securing that internship unit for the industry partner. So of course, the mutually beneficial collaboration with partners such as provincial um, government would be critical for the success of Canadian, Canada's national quantum strategy. So in Alberta, in 2022, Alberta government has announced $23 million funding to establish this initiative, Quantum City. And Quantum City is the quantum technology hub based in Calgary. So this initiative essentially created a three-party alliance between the uh, government of Alberta and University of Calgary, which has matched the government funding in one-to-one -one cash contribution. And also with um, Emphasis, which is a publicly traded company, IT services company, who has opened up a Calgary office. Um, they have planned to hire up to 1,000 employees in the next couple of years, and the Calgary office is actually their world quantum headquarters. So our vision is a future built by quantum technologies. And then Quantum City's mission is to accelerate the capture of the benefits of quantum research to enable the development of innovative products and services by creating a quantum tech adoption pathways. So I want to emphasize that our focus is the pull side of the market, not the push side. We want to actuate, we want to you know, support the application of the quantum science. 
of course, to, to meet our mission, so we have three primary activities. Number one, Quantum City will develop talent. Talent is a critical aspect of our national quantum strategy. So to complement the traditional masters and PhDs in quantum technology, we are creating short-term upskilling and reskilling programs. Um, so the first one we're launching is professional masters in applied quantum computing to be launched this fall. So it's a 12 month sackable degree. So first, first four months will give you a certificate. And then the second four months will give you a diploma. And finally, the four month paid internship will give a student a master's. So then our target market is to upskill um, data scientists and software engineers who have experience in linear algebra and who can code in Python, essentially. So in addition to these upskilling and reskilling programs, we're also creating um, audience appropriate courses, such as courses meant for C-level executives to really um, sort of essentially give them a crash course on what's quantum application in your industry. So in summary, so we want the industry in, in, quant uh, in Alberta to be able to hire new quantum workforce out of traditional masters and PhD. We want the industry able to reskill and upskill their current workforce into quantum. And of course, we want our industry uh, decision makers to be aware of quantum applications. And the second primary activity is quantum cities building that we're building enabling infrastructure. So we're building a fabrication lab here on, in Calgary. And this will be full service fab lab um, for academics and industry in device and hardware sector. And we're also um, creating quantum computing access for our students and um, faculty and industry alike. And finally, uh, the third primary activity is that Quantum City will develop commercialization of quantum technologies to support the adoption of quantum technology by our Alberta's industry. So again, the key is there will be you know, easing the transition of, for, the, for the industry to adopt quantum technology. So, uh, that will be you know, by offering education, by setting up pilot projects, by offering financial incentives and in-kind support to really help them adopt the quantum technologies. And we, we believe that by doing so, we'll be essentially pulling the quantum sciences out of the lab and into applications and into startups. So just in summary, Quantum Cities creating and expanding and sustaining a quantum ecosystem here in Alberta. And so looking at the yellow funnel first, so we are supporting quantum Alberta, Alberta's quantum innovation to solve the world's important problems. And then looking at the red funnel, we also support Alberta's industry to use the world quantum innovation to solve their problems. So with that, I appreciate your time and I'll Pass it on to Claire. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sanders and Dr. Lee. With that, uh, I can start our Q and A session. We have quite a few questions coming in um, from online, and just a reminder uh, to our guests who are uh, online: you can use the question icon uh, to the right of your screen um, to ask questions. And I'll try and select uh, a broad range um, for our speakers here. So let's see. The first question um, that we have. Uh, and you addressed it kind of briefly early on in your um, section, Dr. Sanders, but it's uh, quantum mechanics is a niche area. Um, are you finding it difficult to get labor resources specializing in physics? <clears throat> okay, so yeah, quantum mechanics is a very niche area. It, it is difficult to get the, um, all the resources, human and otherwise. Um, right now, there's a shortage of talent, that there's a growth in industry there's universities around the world that are expanding the area. We need to pull in the you know, good professors. We have to pull in good students, et cetera. It's all very difficult. And um, it's not just you don't just pay more to get better people, but it's the environment, making sure everything's in place. So it's very competitive. We're doing our part. I'm optimistic it's all going to work. Then when it comes to facilities, um, you know, we, we need um, powerful lasers. We have to have fridges that operate near absolute zero. We need the fabrication facility that Megan was talking about. Um, and so it, it, the kind of infrastructure needed to explore, make proofs of concept in this area are very difficult. So yeah, we find it all very difficult. We have to be very strategic in how we go about this. And, uh, and so we're optimistic, but we're, not, we're also realistic about the challenge. Thank you. 
Uh, our next question comes in. Um, currently, the space heating in Alberta heats the air of an entire facility. Can quantum mechanics find a way to only heat the space where people are detected? Basically, to heat a room where people are, not the entire house. <laughs> okay, that's um, so. My my expertise with quantum, I'm much more on the ephemeral, philosophical, mathematical side. Um, when it comes to a very practical problem like this, uh, I'm I'm showing my ignorance. So. I, uh, I'm limited, but it, I'm, for me, it, it's interesting to ask the question. So I don't know the answer, but what's interesting is how I would go about trying to figure out the answer. So the way that I would have to go back on this is say, okay, what is the obstacle to being being able to do this? So if, you know, if if the problem is that um, heating, you know, heat diffuses, and it's a material problem, you know, make some kind of material in the room to hold it in, we could explore that. Is it a computational bottleneck? Is it that there is a way to do it, but the problem is executing the algorithms that would be able to make sure that the heat is directed appropriately, um, and so on and so forth. And so each time that I engage in a practical problem that has industrial relevance, it, it can take quite a while to be able to um, take the challenge and then our, break it down, dissect it into components, and figure out which components are quantum technology friendly and which are not. And so I, I, don't answer, I can't answer the question, but I can tell you the process by which it would take time to be able to sort out whether there is a quantum technology solution. Thank you. Our next question comes in from uh, Jed Conlin. Um, he asks, what are the latest details regarding the speed of information transfer between two entangled particles when their superposition is resolved? Bracket spin direction. I can start with that <laughs> part. There's a second part after that. Or he says, last I heard, it continues to be instantaneous regardless of distance, thus could be much quicker than the speed of light. Has there been progress in measuring this, which has not made it into the mainstream yet? <laughs> okay, yeah, this is a, a, a problem that has a source back in, in I mean, popular literature for a long time. So the idea is that, uh, so the, the puzzle is this, that given there's entanglement, I, I mentioned about spreading entanglement, and there are different ways to entangle. I talked about the nucleus and the state of the cat, but we can have an electron that has a spin and make two electrons. So spin can be another way to, another property of something to be able to entangle. And so the argument of instantaneity works like this. It says if we write down the quantum state for the system and say one particle's on Earth and the other's on the moon, and then we measure the state of the particle on the moon, through the entanglement we instantaneously know what the state of the particle is on the Earth. And so it seems at first sight to be a violation of Einstein's principle that the speed of light is the limit, uh, the limiting rate of how fast we can transfer information. But um, I can make that a non-quantum problem. I could just tell you, imagine there's a coin on Earth and a coin on the moon, and I tell you that uh, the coin, both coins are heads or both coins are tails. And then you're on the moon and you look at the coin, you say it's a head, then you know instantly it's a, a, a head on the Earth. It's the same kind of instantaneity that comes into play. So the instantaneity of knowledge is not equivalent to the instantaneity of transferring information. So the person on the moon learns that the coin is heads, and I'm on the Earth, it'll still take, what is it, a quarter of a second for information to get from the moon to the Earth. It'll still have that time delay, at least, for me to be able to assess it. So um, the, so the, but has there been progress on it? Um, these kinds of things, like uh, how fast information you can go through in barriers, these are exploited both, uh, both theoretically and experimentally. But the fundamental problem, to me, comes out of a, an effort to try to explain quantum mechanics a little bit more simply than it can be. That's, as I told you, nobody really understands quantum mechanics, but we always want to be able to make, say it in a way that it feels understandable, and then we always get these puzzles because say, well, if that, you know, a smart person will say, if what you say makes sense, then how can this follow? And then we say, oops, not, our explanation's not perfect. Hope that helps. Yes, thank you. Um, another question, what opportunities might exist for you to partner in industry or partner with industry to apply and test applications in the future? Well, so the, um, the biggest problem we face in moving uh, what's going on in labs to the uh, industrial world is, is the use case side. It's the question, for example, the question that came up about the um, heating, heating, targeted heating in a room. Um, we, we need to, it's going to take us time, but it's really exploring what are the problems in industry, what, uh, what are the challenges that are quantum technology friendly, and we really 
don't have expert knowledge in that area. So we want to be able to partner with industry to be able to solve the problems. But then the question is, how do we do it? You know, and um, so at the moment, we're, uh, it's still confidential, but we, we have another partner coming into Calgary. And that partner, it's a major company everybody's heard of here. And it would be, um, it's a solutions team. And so some of the big companies, particularly in the US, uh, are developing solutions teams that know quantum. And so our strategy for the time being is not, like for me as a professor with esoteric knowledge, talking about the practical problems, it's, it's very difficult to be able to engage in that. We need more people to do it. We're not able to hire all the people to come in. So we're, we're using some of our money to engender corporate partnerships to be able to be the bridge between the two to, to assess it. And for that, we need to um, take a solutions perspective. What's the problem? How is it solved? What are the tools we have? How to be able to apply them? Um, so that's the strategy we're going. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Um, another question we have that came in, uh, what are some potential implications of pairing quantum computing with emerging AI technologies, such as hmm. chat GPT? Yeah, okay, so that was the slide I brushed over, I mentioned, I bragged that my student wrote that paper and I didn't, former student, and I didn't, uh, but yeah, Nathan Weeb, he's a professor at the University of Toronto now. Um, so, uh, and, and actually, maybe it's worth mentioning, he's half computer science, half physics, so we're into this, um, physics, computer science, hybrid way of thinking sometimes. Um, so what are the implications? Um, I, I told you what are the essential algorithms that we exploit. So we, we have advantages with respect to searching unstructured data, advantages in finding periods, ad potential advantages in optimization, and um, advantages in, in determining the lowest energy state of a system. So then the question with machine learning is, where does it come into play? Now, in machine learning, chat GPT, et cetera, there's optimization algorithms that run. So the idea is that a quantum computer doesn't replace, it would employ that optimization to be able to speed it up. Or it can be in training, that their training data for machine learning, uh, once, if you can get it down to a point, pad it so that you eliminate the, the structure, then we can offer quadratic advantages in some ways, and papers are written about this kind of thing. So in, in one side of the machine learning, we go through it and we say, um, what are the tools we have? What, where's machine learning running to problems? And then we try to solve them. And one of the most promising areas in that direction is rare event prediction. So do we want to speed up it? Do we want to speed it up? So do we want ChatGPT to work faster? Or do we want it to say stupid things less often? And anybody who goes into it, you realize it says a lot of stupid things. And so the, that would be more the promising direction, contingent on certain things working. The other side I mentioned is we can then say, well, let's take a model, so deep neural networks. Let's imagine it as a physical system and then write that as a quantum version of itself. And then do we, uh, can the quantum version provide models that are superior in some way? And so kernel methods, model development, all that is another area of exploration, and it could be helpful. So ChatGPT uses large language models or foundational models. Maybe there are models inspired or practical through using quantum computing that would replace those. And then how to do it is, is wide open. There's nobody, you, you know, we're still trying to grasp these essentials. And we run into problems, like a deep neural network. As it goes deeper, Entanglement, which is a resource for some things, turns into a mess that you wind up with. When you try to optimize, and you get entanglement across a quantum version of a deep neural network. It, it makes things bad. So we're exploring, and we're running into lots of challenges. Very early stage. Perfect. Our next question uh, is specifically regarding quantum computers. So are currently available quantum computers useful for commercial tasks, or are they primarily for research at the current time? Yeah, um, so the, no commercial quantum computer today can solve a problem that can't be done on a laptop. So, um, so if, any, you know, if, if you ever explore that, that's what you need to know. The, so if you have a problem today and you want it solved today, don't use a quantum computer. The question is what happens a few years down the road with the kind of problems that um, uh, might need a quantum computer to solve. And, and then suppose that in three years, the quantum computer has reached scale that it can solve the problem. And you say, okay, I'll wait three years, then I'll use it to solve my problem. It doesn't work that way. That the computational problem, like, it, okay, when I've gone through with companies, 
there's um, you know all the software, and then there's packages and libraries and all that. And it's very hard to figure out deep down where the computational bottleneck is and how to how to address it. And so if the quantum computer turns out in three years that it's vital in solving a problem, you don't want a competitor to get there first. And so the idea of quantum computing today is really take these computational problems, um, write them in ways that they can be run on commercial quantum computers, perhaps today, or cheaper, run them on simulators of quantum computers to save money and effort, and then know how to adapt to uh, if and when the quantum computer is at scale to be able to solve it. So answer is quantum computers today won't solve any problem you consider important, but don't assume that when they're ready you can just walk in and it's not going to be plug and play. It's going to be a challenge for years. Thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Amanda Robertson. Uh, she asks, do you have any favorite books or videos that introduce quantum theories? <laughs> yeah, so that, uh, that's how. Um, the an uh, yeah, the, the answer, unfortunately, is no. The, the, let me explain. So I've been doing this quantum field for, um, what, for uh, 20, 35 years, some, some horribly long period of time. So I've grown up with the field. So I never read these books as the problem. Um, I kind of grew up with all this stuff as it happened. So I'm not the one to ask about that. Like I, I should do it. I should do the homework and then say, here's some good books to read. But I don't, I don't read them, so I don't have the answer. Um, what I do find, depends on your perspective, but like if I'm looking for things that augment my own understanding, um, there's, you know, there's articles like The Economist magazine, it calls itself a newspaper, um, has, a, has had a few articles on, on quantum and does give references there. So I kind of like when The Economist writes about the strategic value, it's really good. If it's about, um, yeah, it, if somebody wants to read about quantum mechanics in general, there's a whole lot of books at a bookstore if they still exist. So there's um, all these possibilities. Um, yeah, I think if somebody wants to know, send me an email and I'll, I'll get it. I'll actually do it and be ready for my next talk to give a reference. Perfect. Our next question comes uh, from Bob Booth. He asks, what are the barriers in Canada to achieving more effective partnering between academic institutions and business? Can I let Megan take that one? You? Of course. Oh. Um, I don't want to hog the mic. <laughs> the question. Yeah, sorry, I let you go up. Um, the question is, what are the barriers in Canada to achieving more effective partnering between academic institutions and businesses? I mean, it's a very good question. I think there are several barriers. I mean, you know, of course, um, I would say money is one of them, but, you know, government, Canadian government has, you know, like I said, has national quantum strategy. They're really putting on a lot of effort. And I think, I Maybe mean, the most important thing is not really money, but making the connections even to begin with for them to find out, okay, you know, like it's a rapidly growing field. Where can I even go to find a person to talk to or, you know, to start my you know, journey of this quantumness? So, you know, to plug Quantum City here, you know, we want to be that sort of a one-stop shop for, you know, at least for Alberta industry to begin with. You know, we, can, we want to be that person kind of being the honest advisor to give education and to, you know, to educate industry on, you know, what to know, what to avoid. But on, you know, on the flip side, you know, we you know to help the academia, we want to know what are the you know, compelling problems the industry wants to solve. Because, you know, the, the priorities for academia don't necessarily line with priorities of industry. So we want to be that, you know, sort of the middle person um, to bridge that gap that always has been. Thank you. And that uh, kind of ties into our next question we have here. Um, will there be funding or scholarships available for those pursuing a master's in quantum computing? Yes, absolutely. Um, it is our first year, like I mentioned, and of course we want to be a very successful program. And we believe that it will be a very popular program based on our feedback. To essentially build this program, you know, we really engage the industry. This is not a traditional, um, traditional uh, master's and PhD you're building. This is really based on industry need. So, you know, of course, if you go to a big university, they'll have master's and PhDs in quantum computing. But our degree is different in a way that you know, we're not teaching, you know, X Y Z because we have professors in X Y Z. We've gone to, you know, potential 
employers of these quantum scientists and ask, what are you not seeing in your potential applicants? And we are basing, uh, designing our cur curriculum based on their feedback. And, and we've also asked them, will you, do, will you sit in our advisory? Then will you hire our interns and grads? And you know, we've always got enthusiastic, yes, yes, yes. So, so we think it will be a very popular program. And yes, we'll definitely be offering um, scholarships for excellent candidates because we want this to be a successful program to begin with. Thank you. And we have one more question uh, online from Dustin Boyce, who asks, what are the financial benefits that a company can expect to see from adaptation of quantum tech into their processes? What industry or sectors stand to benefit the most from adaptation of the technology? And are there any real world examples of the adaptation of quantum tech into industry? Would you like me to give a very layman version, then you take over? <laughs> um, like Barry mentioned, you know, of course, it has potential to impact, you know, almost every aspect of our lives. Um, but I would say, you know, every everyone is scrambling to get that first use case, and it appears that you know there's a lot of focus, um, at least from what I've seen, on the energy sector and the automotives, and essentially, you know, any industry that that are innovative and want to do pilot project has the means to do pilot projects, but you know, have sort of optimization problem to solve. So a little bit of transportation or logistics or um, uh, smart grid designing. Um, but I do see that there is a you know, appetite for even more difficult problems like chemistry simulation for pharmaceuticals um, or even battery, battery manufacturers. But I would say, yeah, so it's potential to impact many industries. But so far, we've seen lots of interest from energy and logistics and automotive. But. Well, that was a great and accurate summary. Um, and then if I add on the battery one, yeah. So I mentioned about the simulation and so um, battery, but particularly catalysts. So uh, the, the question of whether a catalyst will speed up a reaction or improve efficiency or, or whatever, um, the idea that we can make use of quantum computing to uh, estimate the ground state of so the, the lowest energy state of a molecule is important in studying catalysis. So that's an example where there is investment on the industry side to, to be able to explore these things. And um, there are companies, pharmaceutical companies, that invest in that too. They're, they have local teams that work on it. Another one that is of, of high interest is um, in finance. It's the portfolio optimization problem. Um, Goldman Sachs, as an example, has a quantum team in their company, and they explore and develop techniques to use quantum and quantum-inspired algorithms to be able to, um, uh, to, to work on that. It's, it's a constrained, discrete opti uh, combinatorial optimization problem. The one that we're getting uh, from industry a lot of attention right now, as I mentioned before, is this post-quantum crypto. So um, the top-level crypto standard is likely next year to uh, have a post-quantum crypto element. It'll be mandated for secure communication, and so there is a, an appetite in industry more than we can satisfy in academia to be able to, uh, to address the needs. You know, you start saying, okay, well, we have this post-quantum crypto standard. What does that mean if I'm making a network? What does it mean if I have an underlying communication system that's international and I can't secure the uh, intermediate range? And so these kinds of things are coming up, and the talent shortage globally is, is really apparent because uh, so, it, but that's a definite need. And then in the sensing direction, um, the diamond stuff is, is really popular. I mentioned we're setting part of the quantum fabric, the fabrication facility we're setting up is developed as diamond based one. Um, we always worry because, uh, you know, there's always the danger of having uh, a solution without a problem. Um, so with the diamond stuff, there's still exploration going on. It really is a very good sensor in a lot of ways, but it has to make um, economic and business sense to do it. Um, so right now, uh, an example of, of where, there's, where there's exploration of use cases, NRCAN has had test cases with this kind of, they're, they're interested in whether it can help with mining. There's biosensing applications that take place. And um, uh, yeah, I guess those are examples. But what's, what's it, there's not a lot to draw on because two years ago there was almost no industry involvement. And right now there's a very rapid growth of, uh, pilot projects to test out different things. Um, so that's where we're at. Thank you. And we have one more question um, 
back regarding the program, so how many students will be accepted into the quantum computing graduate program? Well, so the, the quantum computing graduate program, um, our goal is a steady state of 50 graduate students, so the, the uh, um, 50 per year. But as Megan said, it's still early stage. So um, I think our intake is 10 or next year or 20? 15. No, next year? 50. Oh. 15. Oh, 15. Oh, few. Okay. Yeah, so 15. So what we're, we're getting the bugs out of it. We'll accept students um, smaller than that. The funding that we've received last year gives, basically it uh, de-risks everything for us. We can offer a new degree where we're supposed to charge a lot of money, but we don't need the money because we have the funding to be able to set everything up. That's one reason we can make lots of scholarships. Um, so it'll be 15 students to begin with, but the steady state will be 50 students a year. And the dream would be half regional and half global. And then if we keep half global, we make sure that it's extremely, you know, we can uh, always make sure the reputation's high pick, you know, be very selective, but then having the regional component, of course, there are very smart people locally too, um, but we also make sure that we uh, are developing a local talent pool. If the degree is solely about educating the, the world, then it doesn't serve the needs locally. And then we're working on partnerships with all this kind of stuff, so we have discussions and visits with the University of Sherbrooke, anything from bilingualism to combining with their undergraduate engineering degree. We have a growing uh, collaboration with JESDA, the Geneva Science and Diplomacy Anticipator, where we have the United Nations that is um, considering use cases and we could be a key provider of technologies for that. And so we're at the same time developing the master's degree. We're looking for partners to, to make these use cases and pilot projects to train them. But yeah, so the answer is 50 students a year eventually, half regional and half uh, global. I have another question coming in from Jennifer. Um, where can we track slash follow the results from these pilot programs that are being conducted? Oh. Oh. If the question is the pilot that we are organizing or we are leading, um, we are still building our website, unfortunately, so we hope to launch it very soon. But for now, everything will be um, sort of broadcasted through University of Calgary social media or um, uh, the, our news newsletters and news, uh, press releases and LinkedIn sites, but we hope to have our very cool site very soon. So until then, yeah, University of Calgary. Um, it's confidential, <laughs> so I don't want to <laughs> say too much right now. We will be launching something very cool very soon. Um, just right now, it's still sitting, sitting with the legal team. Um, we've been working on it for a while, so we're just so excited to launch this thing. But um, essentially, yes, uh, we'll be launching a very cool quantum pilot, really um, targeting, I mean, it's aimed at Alberta's energy players, energy industry players. So watch out for that. It will be a big news splash. And with that, uh, I want to thank you so very much, Dr. Sanders and Dr. Lee, um, both for your remarks and your answers today. Uh, and thank you to all my colleagues who helped put this event together, as well as everybody online uh, who's joined us today. Thank you for your interest in the Atco Space Lab Speaker Series. Um, I also want to announce that our next uh, speaker event will be held on May 4th. That's going to be with Dr. Michael Hart. Uh, Vice Provost and Associate Vice President of Research and, and Indigenous Engagement from the University of Calgary, and we hope you can join us then. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Barry.